Welcome everyone and thank you for coming. Welcome to our students, community members, teachers, journalists, and our two candidates for our Orleans County State Senate seat. We appreciate your time and energy dedicated to the democratic process and please welcome our Craftsbury Acad Academy principal, Miss Lisa McCarthy. Welcome and thank you for coming. It's so great to see so many community members here today and of course all of the students. Um, I want to give a few thanks um, before Mr. Rivers explains the process we used for the debate today. Um, the first person I want to thank is Todd Rivers. So big round of applause for Todd Rivers. <laughs> um, Mr. Rivers is our middle school humanities teacher and this was kind of his project that he kind of pulled other middle school faculty and high school faculty and then students into planning. So it's a great event for our students. Um, in Craftsbury, I think we have a long history of really a high level of respect for tradition and also for civics and democracy. We have several events throughout the year, such as our mock town meeting, our Memorial Day event that we really use to highlight the importance of local government. So. I think this is just one of those events um, that ties right into that theme. Um, and on top of Mr. Rivers, I also want to thank the candidates who are with us today, Samuel Douglas and Catherine Sims. Thank you so much. And last but not least, I want to take a minute to thank the students who are participating in this debate today. It takes a lot of bravery preparation and planning to get to the point um, of being ready for something like this. So nice job, students, also. Okay, and I will turn it over to Mr. Rivers. All right, thanks everybody for coming. So here's how the format will work today. We'll have the timer to your right. The candidates will begin with an introductory st uh, statement of their choosing. They flipped a coin at the beginning. Uh, Sam won the coin toss, he chose to go first. So Catherine will get to go last on the closing statements. They each get a minute and a half for their opening remarks, and then two minutes per question each. Our students thought of the questions. What topics did they want to ask of the candidates that involve them, their families, their community? So they originated the ideas. They spent many lunch periods and recess periods in my room writing their questions, doing some research about their questions, and then lastly, practicing delivering their questions with a microphone in front of an audience. So they did a phenomenal job, worked really hard. So their questions are, there, are what they chose to ask. They will ask a question, they will sit down, each candidate will have two minutes to answer, and we will rotate between candidates in terms of who gets to go first for each question. The questions will appear on this board. Now, we try to make it as large as possible. Hopefully you can see it um, and read along with the questions if you can see it from where you're at. Um, again, the democratic process, we hope there's a great exchange of ideas. We have a retiring senator from our district, so we have a, one of these people. We are new senator in Montpelier, representing 20 towns, Crassberry included, and we hope to hear what they have to say and uh, be able to compare their thoughts and uh, celebrate democracy in America. So, let me welcome our candidates to the podium. Mr. Douglas, Ms. Sims, if you'll come to the podium. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for taking the time out of your day uh, around noon on a work day to come out and, and take part in the democratic process. For all the students here, it's wonderful that you want to be engaged with something like this. We have seen civic engagement declining over the years. When I was go going to school, we certainly didn't have anything like this. So this is a wonder wonderful opportunity for all of you to be able to take a break from your school day and, uh, and, and, fi and finish off the school day with, with a nice debate like this. So, one of the things that I want to leave you with uh, before we start the debate is don't let yourself get pigeonholed into any particular line of thinking. As you enter the political process and as you enter civic life, don't let yourself be taken over by alarms and things like that. Part of the problems that we have right now in this country is we are extremely divided. Yeah, I saw on the board over there it said uh, Republican Sam and, and Democrat Catherine. And I think that's a particularly small way of thinking about the process that we have 
um, as I was speaking with some of the community members before we started, if I had a magic wand, we wouldn't have political parties. That was something that George Washington believed in. That's something that I believe in. I believe that if when you're going to the polls, you should research the candidates that you're voting for and, and you should look up their records and you should look up who they are as a person. You should t make an attempt to talk to them and not just fill in a bubble because that's the party that you believe in. Political parties were very important back in the day when you're working really hard on your farm and you don't have time to go out and research a candidate, to so go listen to them speak. So my big message for you as students is don't let yourselves get put into a box. Keep your minds open. Be free thinking. And don't let anybody ever tell you that because of your age that you're not able to do something. People are going to want to put you in a box as you get older, and they're going to want to say that because of your age... Okay, thank that you. you. Should... Thank you. So thank you so much for being here in person and online. And thank you students and Mr. Rivers and the school for being to be here to talk with you all about the issues that matter to our community. So 20 years ago, I came up here to milk cows at Butterworks Farm. I lived in a little one-room cabin and got up every morning to stoke the wood stove before heading up to the barn. And living with Jack and Ann on the farm, they taught me about hard work. And I found more than a job. I found community. This is a really special place, but our way of life is under threat. Wages are not rising and keeping pace with inflation. Healthcare costs are rising, housing is scarce, property taxes are a heavy burden. We need policies that truly support folks living and working and raising a family and retiring here. I'm running to represent our district, not a party. I believe we do our best work when everyone comes together, we find common ground, and we move forward together. As a state representative, I fought for things that are good for our region, and I stood up and voted no when they weren't. I've helped secure funding to bring high-speed internet to our region. I've helped reform Act 250 to make it easier and faster and cheaper to bring housing in our rural communities. And I've championed tax credits for our seniors, our families, and our military retirees. And I also voted no on the property tax increase because I know Vermonters can't afford it. We face big challenges, but I know that if we come together, we can build a brighter future. I'm ready to step up and run for the Senate to keep fighting for our rural values. Good afternoon, Ms. Sims and Mr. Douglas. My name is Evelyn Patch. I'm a sixth grade athlete here at Crassbury Academy. My question has two parts. First. Why would you like to represent Orleans County as our senator? Second, if you could pass one law with a guaranteed majority in both houses and the gov governor's signature, what would it be? Please explain your reasonings. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for that question. So why am I running for office? I'm running because I care deeply about this place. I have young kids. I want them to be able to grow up here, to find a home here, make a life here. I want to be able to retire in dignity. And I want our communities to be able to adapt to the challenges that we face without losing what makes them special. And life is different up here in the kingdom. Our needs are different in Ch Ch Chittenden County, and too often Montpelier ignores us. I think we need a strong voice, an experienced leader who can help advocate for solutions that really work for the kingdom. And there was a second half to that question. Oh, if we could pass one law, if I had a magic wand. Well, the thing that's top of mind for me right now is the future of public education and ensuring that all kids have access to high quality education at a price that we can afford. Right now, property taxes are too high and we need to contain costs, but not lose our valuable rural schools and access to high quality education for all kids. So I hope that everyone can come together, working across the aisle and collaborate with the governor to pass transformational education reform that ensures high quality education at a price we can afford. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Evelyn, very much for the question. So, the reason why I'm running and the reason why it matters so very much to me is because 
this is the area that I love, this is the area I was born in, this is the area I was raised in, and one that I want to die in. I live in the same town that I grew up in, my family is buried in that town, and that's where I want to be buried as well. I'm fighting so hard because Vermonters are struggling so hard. When I'm going door to door, and I've knocked on thousands and thousands of doors, at least 50% of them, probably much more, are telling me that they are selling their homes, and it is specifically because of the property tax increase that was raised earlier this year, and it is specifically because of the upcoming uh, possible cause, uh, raise in the cost of heating fuels through the Clean Heat Standard. They are selling their homes and they are moving out. When I was at town meeting earlier this year, I, uh, I spoke to a woman in my town who didn't have heat this last winter. People are struggling, and it doesn't matter what political party you believe in, people are opening up their property tax bills and they are struggling so hard for it. And we need people that are willing to bring the common sense and that are willing to put their feet in the sand and not capitulate, that are not gonna have their arms twisted and told that they have to vote a certain way. I'm going down there with the governor's support and the support of the, major the vast majority of our Northeast Kingdom legislators because they know that I will bring those common sense solutions and that I will defend the place that I love so, so very dearly. And to answer the, the second half of your question, Evelyn, um, if I could have one thing pass, uh, that would be a, a repeal or a reform to the Act 250 process. And it's a little, it's, it's pretty complicated. Um, in the 70s, they passed a bill, some legislation that would restrict development to try to preserve the natural landscape of Vermont. Um, and that bill, unfortunately, has some very unintended negative side effects, and that is restricted residential development. Um, the governor has expressed his, will, want, his desire to end that, and I do as well. So if I had that magic wand, I would reform that to let people come in. Hello, Ms. Sims and Mr. Douglas. My name is Jonah Wilberg, and I'm a seventh grade student here at Crassberry. I'm wondering what your position is uh, regarding cell phones in school. According to Vermont Public, banning phones in school is gaining momentum across the state. According to Education Week, at least 11 states have passed statewide restrictions or even outright banning phones in schools. A bill came up during the previous legislative session about banning phones and social media in schools, but ultimately failed. Several states, including Vermont, are also suing Meta, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram, saying the company created addictive apps which harm adolescents. Should schools and school boards ban them or limit them, or is that the job of the legislator? Thank you. Mr. Douglas. Hi, thank you, Jonah. Um, I, I do support those efforts. As a candidate and as an individual, I do believe in, in self-determination and the freedom of individuals to choose where, what they want to do with their lives and, and how they want to live it and the things that they, that they want to buy and use with their own money. Um, but the effects of, of cell phones and, as you said, Meta and Facebook and social media, that has been widely studied and widely discussed. And there's a reason why those states are, are, are passing such legislation. Um, we've even seen in adults, you know, the rise of dopamine addiction, which is, uh, which is I'm, I'm sure you saw that in your research, it's, it's a really serious issue. And it's an issue for adults as well. It's not just for our students, it's not just for our younger people. Um, and it, it negatively affects everybody that has these devices. And you'll find that there's an entire market, an entire um, business venture raised around developing applications, um, and other programs and classes and courses to help you overcome cell phone addiction and overcome social media addiction. There's, there's apps that you can get on your phone that will lock you out of your phone for a certain period of time. And, and there are a lot of reasons why those things exist. And it, it is because of the very negative mental health effects that we see in them. Uh, cell phones and social media have a very, very important role in our world in connecting us on a very, very deep level. And that has been fantastic since they've been in invented. But unfortunately, um, there, there are negative sides to most about everything, and unfortunately that's one of the negative sides of cell phones and, and social media. Um, so I do support those uh, the legislation like that. Um, I also support our schools doing that independently, and if in some cases the schools want to have uh, looser, loose, looser bans on those in their schools for particular reasons, whatever the reason was, I, I do believe that the, the legislation that you're talking about, um, it did not end up passing due to the, uh, the concerns of the impacts that it would have on students that are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so you know, I'm also in favor of schools making those decisions for themselves, but there's some good conversations to be had about that.
Thank you so much for this question. I know it's really timely as this school considers what its policy is and you transition to a new policy in the coming month. And for me as a parent of two kids in the school system, this is a personal issue. Like many of you, I struggle myself with the use of my phone and balancing uh, its ever-present nature for work and staying in touch with family. It can be hard to manage. And on one hand, I want you all to have a um, constructive learning environment where distraction is minimized. And on the other hand, I know that if there were an emergency, I would want to get hold of my kids and know that they were safe. And so I, if we were to take up a statewide ban or other policy around cell phone use, I would treat this topic like other topics, where I want to be informed by those who would be impacted by the decision. So I'd want to hear from students. I'd want to hear from teachers, administrators, and parents. And all of that feedback um, would guide the, uh, the position I took on the bill as we took it up um, in the State House. Because um, my job as a legislator, as a representative, as a senator, would be bringing your voices to the State House, um, carrying your values forward. So um, appreciate this. I think it's a really um, difficult um, and important topic, and um, look forward to hearing from you all as we take up this topic in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question from Mr. Hollis Allen, seventh grade. Good afternoon, Ms. Sims and Mr. Douglas. My name is Hollis Allen. I'm in the seventh grade here at Craftsbury Academy. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, 10 states have full-time legislatures and 40 states have part-time. Each system is unique and lawmakers' pay varies widely. Vermont currently has a part-time legislature. My question, what are the pros and cons of a part-time versus a full-time legislature? Which do you think would provide the most benefit to Vermont? Pay raises have also been a significant topic in this campaign. Do you think lawmakers are paid enough? Thank you. Ms. Sims. Thank you for this question. So I think we make our best decisions when we have a diversity of voices around the table. And as you all know, the legislature makes really impactful decisions that affect all of our lives. And if we want diverse voices at the table, representing real world, everyday experiences, I think we need to address the ability of Vermonters to serve in the legislature. Right now, legislators are paid $13,000 a year with no benefits. And while we're in session January through May, the work continues in the off session. Constituents still have needs um, that legislators can help solve. Uh, there are meetings with advocates and constituents to identify the priorities for future sessions. And actually writing bills begins before the session so that you're ready to go on day one. And I've heard from too many that the current compensation um, deters uh, experienced, capable, passionate folks from stepping up to serve their community. And I'm concerned about a worrying trend. Right now, there are seven first-time candidates running for office who face no opposition. And there are 50 incumbents who are running without any opposition. And without any competition, voters don't get an opportunity to hear different perspectives, different viewpoints, and weigh those. They don't get an opportunity to hold incumbents accountable for decisions that may not have reflected the majority of folks in their district. And so I think reevaluating the current compensation for legislators would help us attract more diverse folks, not those who can just afford to serve because they're wealthy or they're retired or they have privilege. Um, and it would create more competition, which would help drive better decisions so that the legislature is really centering their decision making on the lived experience of everyday Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Douglas. What was your name, young man? Was it Halls? Hollis. Hollis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hollis, for the question. So um, I'll, if, if it's all right with you, I'll, I'll answer the, the second half first and the first part second. Um, I, I, I certainly agree. We need to be holding incumbents accountable for, for the records and the things that they've done. And I would certainly say 
that uh, you know, in a lot of cases across the state, it has been difficult to find people to run for office. But I, I certainly don't think it has very much to do with the pay. Um, I am not retired, nor am I wealthy. My bank account is usually in the negative. I'm my wife and I are paycheck to paycheck. I have that varied background of the working class, middle class Vermonter, and I'm still able to run. Right now, there are 18 members of the Senate right now who have had held no legislative experience before they were elected to the Senate, and many of them did not have any experience on the town on in any sort of government whatsoever. So I think it has little to do with how much legislators are paid and more of their ability to serve in other regards, how much time they have in their lives, whether or not are they a business owner and they're able to take away time from their business. And earning, you know, ten more thousand dollars isn't going to make it easier for them to take time away from their business. Um, it, it's more about the time you have in the day. Having more money given to you as a legislator will not help you run for office if you can't afford to run for office in the first place, if you do not have time to run for office in the first place. To get that money and to get those benefits, you actually have to be in office to get them. So you have to get elected first. And speaking as a candidate who is neither retired nor wealthy, um, raising the money required to do these sort of things is particularly prohibitive. If you wanted to have more people with varied backgrounds running for these positions and getting into office, institute caps on spending for candidates, 10000 for a Senate race, 5000 for a House race, those things would actually help people of varied backgrounds run. And let's talk about other states. Colorado, they meet way less than we do. We do not need a longer legislative session. We are already passing a lot of bills as it is, and a lot of bills that are hurting Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question, Mr. Avery Boyce from seventh grade. Uh, hello, Catherine and Sam. I am Avery Boyce. I am a seventh grader at Craftsbury Academy. I love to hunt and fish. My question is about gun laws, specifically gun laws com compared to other states. According to the company's site mark, there are approximately 50 gun laws that states can adopt to make gun use stricter or safer, depending on your point of view. California is ranked first and has adopted 45 of them, and Mississippi is ranked 50th and has adopted three. Vermont is towards the middle, or middle ranked around 18th. Do you think Vermont's fine at 18th, or should we be more like California or Mississippi? And if so, what laws should we adopt or toss? Please be specific. Thank you. Mr. Douglas. Uh, thank you, Avery, for that question. Thank you very much. Um, no, I think, I think Vermont is, is pretty well good where it is right now. Um, in the state of Vermont, we have a, uh, a gun ownership of, I believe, 43% of Vermonters have a firearm in their home. We also have one of the, lower, uh, the lowest incidences of gun violence in the country. I believe it was 74, on average, 74 Vermonters die due to, due to gun violence per year. And the vast majority of those are suicides, of which the ma vast majority of those suicides are men. I do not think that passing stricter gun control uh, measures are really going to do very much in, in helping a state that has a very long cultural history of gun safety. As a, as a, young, as a young person, I, you know, when we had Nerf guns in the house, I wasn't even allowed to point Nerf guns at people or animals because I was raised with the Northeast Kingdom values of being responsible with your weapons. And notice I said weapons there. I didn't say toys, because guns are not toys. And that is how everybody here in the Northeast Kingdom has been traditionally been raised. Um, passing gun control uh, measures is not going to help in, in an area where we already have such a respect for these weapons and where we use them for hunting and we use them for self-defense. And I really do worry about passing legislation that very well may be unconstitutional. In the recent Bruin case handed down by the Supreme Court, it's, they're, they're looking at a lot of gun control across the country and deeming most of that as unconstitutional. So as a legislator, I, I don't believe that I can go down there with any good conscience and, and vote for legislation that is possibly going to be unconstitutional. Um, as I said, Vermont is one of the safest states when it comes to gun violence, and many of us enjoyed their use for personal protection, for hunting, and some people enjoy shooting them at ranges. I wish I could afford that, but, um, so no. Thank you very much, Avery, and that, that's all I need for that one. Thank you, thank you. Ms. Sims. Yeah, thank you for the question. 
So I support the Second Amendment, and I think it goes hand in hand with gun safety. My husband and I are gun owners, and I deeply respect Vermont's hunting traditions and value of responsible firearm ownership. So I currently, I support our current gun safety legislation, which we've passed in the previous sessions to address critical issues like rising suicide rates, domestic violence, and public safety. Um, safe storage being one of those that passed last session, I see as a common sense measure. We know that 74% of school shooters obtained firearm, firearms in the home. And so when uh, guns are stored safely, we're all safer. Similarly, laws like the Extreme Risk Protection Order allow families and communities to step in when someone poses a threat to themselves or the community and help prevent gun-related tragedies. Lastly, I think responsible waiting periods that we currently have give space and time to reduce the risk of suicide and other preventable incidents. And we've already heard stories about how the laws that we passed in previous sessions are saving lives. I'd also want to just take a minute to call attention to the need to invest in mental health care for our communities. Um, the more that we can provide support within our schools, within the workplace, within our healthcare system, um, we can help foster a safe and healthy community environment. So I'm comfortable with the gun laws that we have today, and I think uh, they support responsible gun ownership and help uh, keep people safe in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question by Ms. Ora Noble from eighth grade. Good afternoon, Ms. Sims and Mr. Douglas. My name is Ora Noble and I'm in eighth grade here at Craftsbury Academy. According to the University of Vermont, property damages from flooding in Vermont are calculated to exceed 5.2 billion over the next 100 years. My question, how does a small state already struggling with property taxes afford frequently occurring flood damage and the cost of those repairs? If you were elected to the state senate, what solutions would you propose to help this mighty little state stem the tide? Thank you. Thank you, Aura. Ms. Sims. Thank you. Another really timely question. The floods over the last two years have highlighted that changing weather is here and that we need to continue to do more to keep ourselves safe and support quick recovery. So I'm trying to find the right distance so you can hear me, but there's no weird feedback. Um, and uh, as we just heard, the cost of climate change is significant. I just want to step back and talk a little bit about some of the work that I've done around the floods that we've had in the past. So. Uh, before the most recent flood, I used my platform as a legislator to provide resources and information in advance of the flood so folks had safety tips at the ready and uh, resources that they could reach out to if needed um, after the flood. Then I reached out directly to towns and individuals to address issues as they came up. I helped Burke uh, get a temporary bridge that they needed to keep traffic flowing in the community. I helped uh, a business owner access the BGAP grant program to rebuild their infrastructure after the flood. And uh, when Orleans County was not included in the uh, disaster declaration in 2023, worked with FEMA on the ground to get the data needed so that we had uh, demonstrated the level of impact necessary to be included in the federal disaster declaration and get Vermonters access to the federal support they needed to recover. But that was just the beginning. Then as we went back into session in 2024, I introduced legislation to help address some of our emergency preparedness shortcomings and to introduce um, a bill to create a climate um, and disaster mitigation fund to provide access to resources to communities to help us rebuild smarter so that we can prevent disaster um, uh, in advance and save us money. So I was proud to help introduce and pass that bill, but our work is just beginning. I will continue to be a strong voice for our rural communities to make sure that as we invest dollars in uh, being more prepared for uh, changing weather, we aren't forgotten, that we aren't left behind, and that low and moderate income Vermonters aren't bearing the costs of that. Thank you. Uh, your name was Aura, right? Thank you, Aura, for the question. Um, so the, the flooding issue has been on the minds of everybody, especially up here in the Northeast Kingdom. We've been hit particularly hard over the last couple of years um, in a way that we haven't been hit like that in 
a very, 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 very long time. And I think a big part of the reason why there's a lot of struggle around this is not only just the property damage and the loss of life, but it's also the fact that we're not prepared for these sort of things. After the first flood, I heard a lot of people saying, oh, this was a historic flood. It's likely not going to happen again. We'll, you know, we'll be all right for, for, the, for a couple of years. And here it is the next summer. We're having it again. And Catherine's absolutely right about the changing, the changing climate and the issues that we have surrounding that and how these weather incidences could certainly be getting worse and more frequent. I think what we need a lot more of and something that I'm very happy to put forward in the Senate and to work across party lines to get this done is to have more techniques brought in to allow homeowners to properly, using good 21st century methods of flood prevention, to protect their homes and protect their families and their livestock. Um, I had this experience myself with, with our garden, with our family farm, in that um, my beehives were completely flooded out, our gardens were completely flooded out, our chicken coop was flooded out. And so there is a great life, uh, a, light, a great loss of life, especially in our agriculture community, for their livelihoods. And I know that the flooding has certainly affected a lot of our apple orchards. And it, it's, it's a lot more than just, just people's homes. It's all encompassing across the state. And I think there's a lot of things that could be done, and I'm very happy to introduce those and work those to get them to the finish line. Uh, one of those things I was talking about recently with some of the, with some of the local reps over in Burke, um, and also uh, one of my friends who works as uh, the town town administrator, is having uh, drones. This was an interesting idea that was proposed that I would be happy to try to find some funding for. One of the issues we had is so many people, out of the goodness of their heart, wanted to get in there and help with the flood relief. I was one of them, and I spent weeks out of this last out of this campaign out of this summer over in Burke and Lindenville helping with the flood relief, and I was finding that there was a lot of areas we just couldn't get into. And a lot of those people living in those homes, they still needed resources, they still needed food and water. So one of the ideas that we've been talking about and that I've already been working with members of the Senate on is finding uh, resources and funding for, for drones to be able to fly those resources into people. Thank That's you. one idea. Thank you, thank you. Our next question will be from Nora Van Goulden, subbing for Ada Allen. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Sims and Mr. Douglas. My name is Nora Van Golden, and like Mr. Rivers said, I'm filling in for Ada Allen, who had a playoff game today, so good luck. Yeah. Um, so going to a small school, I am aware of how they add to Vermont's uniqueness. They also cost more than larger schools. Last year, many communities across Vermont saw major property tax increases due in part to education spending. Currently, Vermont has the fifth highest property tax rate in the U.S., according to the United Paramount Tax Group. This is a major concern for Vermonters. Many are worried about larger increases next year. Some believe Vermont's small schools are part of the spending problem. Others say that consolidation efforts, like Act 46, failed to cut spending. Nobody seems to agree on the facts. How would you, as a legislator, approach such education spending and planning issues while also supporting Vermont's small community schools like Crossbury. Thank you. Thank you. What was your name? Nora. Thank you very much, Nora, and thank you, Ada, as well. Hope you're enjoying your time playing sports. Um, so yeah, this is a really, really important issue this year, and it's going to be a very important issue next year. The governor has recently said that there's going to be um, at least around 7% increase next year as well, perhaps more. Um, so this is definitely something that needs to be brought up um, as one of the centers of attention in the legislature in this coming session. Um, and I've had a lot of conversations with, with several members of the House and Senate that are currently serving about the ways that we are going to try to tackle this. And uh, a big part of it is, is what you said right there about the facts. And, as a candidate and as a senator, I am pragmatic and I am very fact-based. So, you know, even wherein the issues might not be popular among the, among the local communities, I'm committed to what's going to be most practical and what's going to provide the best quality of education for our students, while at the same time providing as much tax relief to our property taxpayers as possible. If uh, families continue to leave, as I have been speaking to many families, and they're not able to live in the state of Vermont because of the rising property taxes and along with all the other costs, we won't have students to teach. So the decrease of students year to year has made it very difficult for a lot of schools to operate, especially when it comes to funding. And um, I went to a community school. I like community schools. But in cases where they're not practical, we need to, be, we need to have some common sense about these things and do what the local community feels is best while also respecting the property taxpayers. 
Um, obviously, consolidation um, is a very, very hard issue to talk about, uh, especially in our local communities up here in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, and those changes need to happen organically. I do think that that's probably the best way to go forward, um, rather than just cramming schools together that don't have any you know, cultural significance to each other or having any other close connections. So I, I do believe in school consolidation where necessary, but I also don't believe it where it's not necessary. And I think it's going to be up to the local communities to tell us what's going to be the best way to go forward while using that fact-based approach that I hold so dear. So thank you very much for that question, Nora. And again, Ada, thank you very much as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sims. Thank you for the question. So school spending is up $189 million this year over the previous year. And there are a lot of pressures that our schools are facing. 16% increase in health care costs, the end of the federal ESSER COVID funds, inflationary pressures that we're all facing, and lots of deferred maintenance. Schools need our support, but these increases are not sustainable. And again, that's why I voted against the property tax increase bill, because I know Vermonters can't afford to pay more. And this has got to be the number one issue that the legislature is focused on next session. Last session, we passed the Commission on the Future of Education and tasked them with transforming the system and coming back to the legislature with recommendations. And I'll be advocating for an overhaul. We need to ensure high quality education for all kids, including our rural communities, at a price that we can afford. And I'll be advocating that we look at a foundation formula that's weighted for the different needs of communities, which is how the majority of other states fund education. And that would bring up low spending schools and provide pressure downward on our high spending schools so that everybody has access to an edu equitable education. And it will prompt some tough conversations about cost containment. We'll need to take a hard look at the drivers around education spending, rising health care costs, administrative costs, staff-student ratios. But I trust our schools and our communities to make thoughtful decisions that center what's best for our kids. And let me be clear, I will be fighting for our rural schools. Yes, there are some places where building reconfiguration can achieve savings without harming educational opportunities for kids. But just like I fought to fix the weights in our current formula so that our rural schools had access to their fair share of resources, I'll be fighting to make sure that we're not closing rural schools where consolidation is not an option. We need to be in the driver's seat about what buildings uh, make the most sense for our communities. I won't let Montpelier make that decision for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Grader Cosmo Gletzos. Hello, Ms. Sins and Mr. Douglas. It's amazing to have the opportunity to talk with you this afternoon. Um, my name is Cosmos Gletzos, and I'm a 10th grader at Craftsbury Academy. And today I'd like to address the topic of gun violence within the United States. Vermont has a low crime rate and is considered to be one of the safer states. However, the possibility of a school shooting is real. Statistically speaking, each day 12 children die from gun violence in the United States. And in just 2024, there have been 163 instances of gunfire on school grounds, according to the website Everytown, which is a gun safety nonprofit. It is only a matter of time until one of our schools falls victim to one of these attacks. And I want to ask what your opinion or plan to prevent violence in Vermont schools and ensure we can go to school and come home again. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sims. Every student deserves a safe learning environment. And as a parent, this is the nightmare that keeps me up at night. And I think we need a comprehensive approach ensuring that our students are safe. And I think that's about three things. I think it's about school security infrastructure. We need to make sure that we have secure entrances, the systems, and the trained personnel that we need in the building to be safe. I think it's about addressing mental health. We need to make sure that there are sufficient counselors and professionals within our schools and that we're implementing all of the best practices around anti-bullying, um, conflict resolution, peer support, creating that positive school culture and addressing um, student uh, mental health needs as they arise. And I think back to our earlier question, it's also about common sense firearm laws to keep guns out of the hands of people who pose a threat. 
I support universal background checks and the extreme risk protection orders to make sure that firearms are kept out of schools and away from individuals um, who shouldn't have them. And I think with this holistic approach, we can be doing more to keep kids safe. I also want to take a minute to address something bigger here. I think those of us who are running for office are role models for our communities and that we have a responsibility to lead with civility and respect. I'm disappointed that my opponent has resorted to lying about my record and sending negative attack mailers. Even when we disagree, we can do that without tearing each other down. Politics shouldn't be personal. We owe it to the voters, to our community, to model how we can disagree about the issues with respect and stay focused on the issues that will solve the challenges our communities face. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Douglas. Hi, thank you very much for the question, and I'm, I'm very happy to address that as well. But I would like to also just address what Catherine has just said, and I, I'm certainly happy to hear that you agree that your record is negative. I, I'm happy to hear that. Um, and I wouldn't say that calling out a public record is all that negative, and I'm certainly not making it personal, as I've been hearing you making very personal remarks about my age, which I think here in a school with younger students, I think is a very touchy subject to talk about when we're encouraging young students to get involved in the civic process while also making very derogatory remarks about my age and my ability to serve. But to answer the question, which was about uh, violence in schools around firearms, I'd like to say, so I'm, I live in North Troy and I live right down the street from where we recently had an incident. Thankfully, there were no firearms involved in that incident, but it does bring up a very interesting point, a very important point about the safety of our schools. And I absolutely agree that we need to address having the physical barriers in place at schools, and we need to address the culture and the mental health that goes behind those decisions that some of our students or some of our community members may make. Um, there's a reason why, and I said this earlier, there's a reason why Vermont has a very low incidence of gun violence, and that's because we have the culture that supports it in the opposite direction. We have a healthy respect for firearms, and we do not view them as toys. We view them as deadly weapons because that's what they are. And we've had that low rate for such a small, for such a long time because we have that healthy respect. And it is all about the culture that we have around them. If we are going to teach students that there's something to be afraid of, then there's going to be no experience and no exposure for those students. I grew up using them. I grew up shooting targets in my backyard. We grew up doing Easter egg hunts, and not the normal Easter egg hunts you might you might be aware of, but using BB guns to go out and shoot the eggs that you have hidden around the yard. That's the culture of in the firearms in the Northeast Kingdom that we've had, the culture of hunting and the culture of providing for your family. And we need to have that culture back. That's why our rates are so low. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have four questions left. Uh, our 10th grader, Arwen Alexander. Thank you. Hello, Ms. Sims and Mr. Douglas. It's a pleasure having you both here today. My name is Aaron Alexander, and I'm in the 10th grade at Craftsbury Academy. As a 15-year-old, I know many adolescents use drugs and addictive substances. According to the Vermont Department of Health, we are among the states with the highest levels of substance abuse, specifically rates of heroin use by 18 to 25-year-olds. In the past few years, there have been discussions about decriminalizing possession of small amounts of drugs in Vermont. Vermont is not the first to contemplate this idea. In 2021, Oregon chose to decriminalize small amounts of hard drugs, such as cocaine, fentanyl, and heroin. It became the first state and so far the only state to do so. However, in 2023, Oregon repealed the law recriminalizing the possession of drugs. Is Vermont moving toward Oregon's failed experiment of drug decriminalization? A bill written in 2021 detailed the decriminalization of personal use supplies of a regulated drug in Vermont. Ms. Sims, you were one of the co-sponsors of this bill. What are both of your stances on decriminalizing drugs in Vermont and what is your reasoning? Please be specific about which drugs. Thank you. Mr. Douglas. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much for that question. So, um, 
as I said earlier, I'm a fact-based candidate, and as senator, I will be also fact-based and pragmatic, and I'm open to any conversations about most any bill. Um, and this is, this is one of those bills. I'm open to conversation on that. However, you're completely right in saying that the Oregon experiment was, was certainly a failure. And I think that also goes back to the culture that we have around those substances. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure in Europe, they also have very similar uh, instances of decriminalization, but they also have a different culture. And the reason why the Oregon experiment failed is because we do not have that culture. Um, there have been very, very many excellent investigative journalism pieces on the ground in Oregon that went around asking people, drug users, why they, um, what, what they thought about those bills. And across the board, many of them didn't agree with the bill either, and they were the ones using the substances. So I, uh, as of right now, no, I do not support that sort of legislation. Um, but as I said, I'm always happy to have conversations about most every legislation, and that's certainly one of them. As a mental health uh, worker, as a practitioner in the mental health system, I see addicts all the time. We have them come into my facility all the time. And it is certainly a, a very touchy topic to have and to, to talk about them with. But unfortunately, in the state of Vermont, our mental health services have not been adequate, especially in those regards. And I'd certainly like to see more funding being directed towards that area, and not just funding, but also making sure that we have efficiencies. As somebody that works in the mental health and the substance abuse communities, there are a lot of instances where we have inefficiencies, and those go to wasting funding. So it's not just about the, having the funding available, it's also about having the efficiencies and the proper policies in place at the various different agencies and making sure that they're actually using the money for, for the right things and making sure that we do have a fact base and, a, and a, um, a, a scientific basis for the policies that we have. And if something isn't working, we need to go back to the drawing board on that, we need to rethink those policies. And I've been in the room for some, for some of those conversations and we need to have a lot more of them. So thank you very much for your question. Thank you, thank you. Ms. Sims. Thank you so much for this question. Let me be clear, I do not support the blanket decriminalization of drugs. This is something where my thinking has evolved over the years as we've seen some of the experiments like the one in Oregon that you mentioned play out and we've seen um, uh, uses uh, increase and we've not had the kind of healthcare response that we've wanted, but my values haven't changed. I think that we need to differentiate between how we treat drug traffickers and violent offenders and those who are struggling with addiction. For drug dealers, especially those trafficking fentanyl and harmful substances within our community who are tearing our communities apart, and um, we must have stiff penalties in place. And we need to have swift consequences um, for criminal behavior which is why we invested in the judiciary system last year and in increased penalties for um, some drug and retail theft offenses. And we need to keep doing more of that so that we're not seeing people back out in our community offending again and again for our drug traffickers and our violent offenders. But I also think that we need a compassionate healthcare response for folks who are battling addiction. Punishing ad uh, addicts without addressing the underlying causes only perpetuates the problem. We need to continue to expand access to treatment, recovery services, mental health care, so that those struggling with substance use get the help they need to get back on track. And I think by tackling this issue with a balanced approach where we're providing stiff uh, consequences for those who are taking advantage of members in our community and those who are struggling and getting them the support that we need, we can tackle this crisis in a meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sims. Our next question from Lillian Allen, a junior here at Craftsbury. Good afternoon, Ms. Sims and Mr. Douglas. My name is Lillian Allen, and I am in 11th grade at Craftsbury Academy. I love riding horses on trails through the woods and fishing. There is talk of breaking tradition and adding two members to the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Board who do not hunt, trap, or fish, but enjoy Vermont's wildlife in other ways. VT Digger states that the Fish and Wildlife Board is currently made up of 14 citizen members appointed by the governor. The board creates and approves all hunting, trapping, and fishing regulations for Vermont's game species. The board is typically made up of active hunters, trappers, and anglers. The board is also highly educated in environmental science, biology, and many other degrees and experiences in this field. 
For months, while game population is stable, and some wonder why changes need to be made, others feel that only including hunters and trappers and fishermen does not fully represent our state. How do you feel about adding non-hunters to our Fish and Wildlife Board? Thank you. Ms. Sims. Thank you for the question. So hunting and trapping are deeply rooted traditions here in Vermont, and they're also important tools around active management and conservation and stewardship of our wildlife. And I support the current um, hunting, fishing, and trapping regulations. These rules, as we heard in the question, were developed with scientific study and robust public engagement to make sure that we are minimizing harm towards animals, pets, people, and using science and best practices to inform that decision. And I'll continue to advocate for responsible, well-regulated hunting and trapping within our community. Um, I would not have supported S-258, the bill that was before the legislature last session that did not come to a vote, because it felt like it was, um, it was not a consensus recommendation. And so as we think about the role of the Fish and Wildlife Board moving forward, I'm always open to conversations and certainly would support all of the stakeholders at the table, hunters, trappers, the current board, animal welfare advocates coming together. And if there were consensus recommendations about how the board should be modernized or what its um, accountability and focus and scope was, um, you know, I'm, I'm open to advancing something that represents a consensus of all the stakeholders at the table. But again, I think we need to stay focused on policies that support um, responsible conservation and active management of wildlife um, and uh, support our current rules and regulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Douglas. Uh, thank you very much, Elian, and thank you very much for the tour. That was lovely. You guys uh, certainly do very well here at Craftsbury. She knew all the answers to my questions, so it was lovely. Um, and really, thank you for the question, because this is one that's very near and dear to my heart, as, uh, as, as I am an angler, and I come from a very strong hunting, fishing, and trapping family. Uh, you go into the, the rec room and the den at my grandparents' house, it's, just no, it's nothing but mounts on the walls. And it is so integral to our culture and our traditions that we have here in the state of Vermont, and those need to be protected as, as much as we can. Um, and I think, and, and no, I, I do not support adding um, non-hunters, non-trappers, non-anglers, or sportsmen to that board for the, for the very same reasons that, that Ms. Sims also mentioned. Um, but I think the root of the matter of why people wanted that legislation in the first place is very important. I think it's because our citizenry does not feel that they have very much say, and I feel that they're not being heard. They have concerns. And those concerns do need to be heard and do need to be addressed. But I don't believe adding people that have no experience in these, in these fields and have no experience with the science and the ecological research that comes with being on that board, I don't think that that's the solution. I think the solution is to address the concerns that people have and, and the root causes of, of why they're bringing them up. And, and I think that's going to be a more compassionate and a more, a more community-based approach to this, to this question. But putting in sweeping legislation to change something that has a very long established positive effect on our wildlife communities and in our communities at, lar at large, I don't think that's the answer. So I think we do need to have a better community-based approach to address the problems and the reasons why people wanted to have those people on the board. Because I think that's important as well. Because what we say as Vermonters should have an impact, we shouldn't have our voices stifled and we shouldn't have our voices unheard or go uh, unaddressed. So thank you very much, Elian, for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Owen Foster, another junior here at Craftsbury. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming here. My name is Owen Foster. I am a junior, a short story writer, a self-taught artist, and the holder for the second place in the Wolcott Elementary talent show in 2017 for bringing a snare and a cymbal to whack whenever I cracked a cringe-inducing joke. <laughs> Can you tell one? <laughs> yep. Uh, before I get started, I just want to say this is the first day in my life that I am now a 17-year-old, so... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> this one's very personal to me. 
I want to discuss the mental health crisis in Vermont teens. According to Vermont's 211 websites between 2016 and 2020, the number of 3 to 17 year olds experiencing depression or anxiety increased by 40%. Vermont's Youth Risk Behavior Survey report from 2019 states that 31% of 9th to 12th graders and 23% of 6th to 8th graders have reported feeling sad, lonely, or hopeless every day for at least two weeks in a row in the previous year. For Pride people, students, and students of color, the number is how significantly been increased as well. Do you feel like this is a major problem? What do you think are the underlying causes for this? And how do you propose to address this situation? Thank you for your time. Mr. Douglas. Thank you very much, Owen, for the question. Um, it is absolutely, certainly, a very important issue. And, and as I said, my work with mental health, I have seen a dramatic rise in people coming into my facility um, that are very, very young, from, you know, uh, from, eight, from 18 to 21, a huge rise, a huge spike in those individuals with a lot of the same things that you're talking about. Um, the rates of depression and feeling hopeless and lonely are rising, and it is not just among our youth, but it has been dramatic in our youth, and I think that's something that we need to address. Um, some of the root causes of that, and you know, I've, in the course of this campaign, I've gone around and I've spoken to dozens and dozens of teachers, and I do this very, very anonymously because I want them to be able to feel like they can say whatever they want to me, and I'm not going to go sharing around that it was them that told me those things. And the things that I'm hearing, especially from the guidance counselors I've spoken to and, and doing my own, uh, in my own training and education with, with childhood and mental illness, is a lot of the generational trauma, especially here in our local and rural communities. Um, also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, cell phones and social media play a large part in that. It's, it's a very complex issue, uh, mental health, and it also includes your diet, it includes the things that happen at home, it includes your um, uh, measuring yourself up to your peers and thinking, you know, this a friend of mine might be doing better in school, but that's okay. You know, I'm doing what I'm doing, and I'm working. I'm working my butt off to, to get my work done, and I don't need to measure myself up to other people. So I think that we do need to have a much stronger approach when it comes to mental health, whether that's funding or whether that's just practice. Um, but the social iso social isolation and social ostracization say that 20 times fast. Those are really big issues, and a lot of them do come from being in such rural communities, and just a decrease in the amount of community that we do have. People going to our community festivals and our fairs, those have really, really gone down um, in, in the course of just my life. And when I was growing up, everybody in the community came out to these things. All the kids were out to those things. And now, when I go to them, um, with the exception of Albany, their, their chicken barbecue, I'm seeing less people showing up. And, and I think that we need to have stronger communities and we need to address the underlying issues in a very proactive way. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sims. Thank you for the question and happy birthday, Owen, yay. Um, but this is a serious question. We have a mental health crisis and we need to do more to make sure that everyone has access to the support and help that they need. Um, how do we solve that? Um, I have been a strong advocate for increasing pay and reimbursements for our mental health care providers. We need to get more parity between mental health care providers and physical health providers. One thing that I was able to accomplish last session, I introduced a bill uh, and helped pass it to uh, provide long-term secure funding for 988, the crisis hotline, so that we have the right place to turn to. So you call 911 if there's a... Uh, emergency that you need a police response and you can call 988 if you have a um, crisis and need to be connected to a counselor. But we also need to expand access right here in our own community and I think that means attracting more mental health care professionals with scholarships, loans, and addressing the housing crisis. Too often I hear from um, health care providers that they've recruited someone, they say yes, they want to take the job, they look for housing for six months and they have to turn it down. Um, so that's a kind of intersectional issue that we need to address. And I also think we need to continue to integrate mental health care um, into our primary care settings, our school settings, our workplace, so that um, we have ready access to that kind of support wherever we are, um, including telehealth options for those of us who live in more remote rural areas. And we need to work on the root causes, poverty, uh, unhoused, uh, housing insecurity, uh, substance use disorder that all contribute to some of our mental health challenges. Um,
There are so many challenges that we face at this time, but I am confident that we all come together, we listen to the diverse perspectives in our community, we work across the aisle, and we can build a brighter future where everyone has an opportunity to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Will Gerhard, our sole senior on our board, will ask the final question. Good afternoon, Mr. Douglas and Ms. Sims. My name is Will Gerhard. I'm 12th grade at Gasparay Academy. Vermont is mainly a rural state with many small towns with small populations. Spread far apart with, wait, sorry. While this style of life is loved by many Vermonters, it brings specific problems more centralized communities lack. One such problem is access to emergency services. Small towns such as Crossbrays do not have their own police departments, doctor's offices, or firehouses. This results in long delays between calling emergency services and their arrival, which can make a tremendous difference in emergencies. If elected to this position, what would you do about this issue? Yeah. Emergency services, quite a distance, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for this question. This isn't actually an issue that I've done a lot of work on. And I'll credit Tim Nisbet, a constituent who flagged this issue for me. I think we all expect an ambulance to come to our aid when we need it. But I was shocked to learn from Tim about the crisis in EMS right now with rising call volume, declining volunteers, and reimbursements that don't cover costs. And so hearing about this crisis, I was motivated to research and learn more about the issue, and then convenes partners across the state, uh, per, uh, EMS providers, hospitals, uh, our agencies, and we asked the questions, what's working, what are the gaps, and what do we need to stabilize EMS in Vermont, especially for our rural communities? And that led to the introduction of H622, which I introduced and passed last session, that made some immediate changes to increase reimbursement rates for EMS providers so that they're now getting uh, Medicaid rates that are 100% of the Medicare rates as well as getting reimbursed for treatment without transporting folks to a hospital. So some immediate changes to stabilize the finances of our EMS providers, but we also set in motion um, a system-wide transformation to ensure efficiency, uh, make sure that we're not leaving rural communities behind, and also lower costs. And when that uh, comes back to the legislature, I look forward to taking action on those recommendations. Um, and I, I just want to highlight that this is how I approach all issues that have come up for me. I am taking on legislative priorities that I hear from constituents. And I'm doing the work to bring people together and have recommendations about how, how we solve these problems come from the stakeholders who are impacted by it. And then I'm rolling up my sleeves, working across the aisle to get co-sponsors and then successfully pass bills that make a difference for our region. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Douglas. Uh, Will, thank you very much for that last question there. Um, so emergency services in our local communities are very, very important, as we all know. Um, myself, when we had a house fire, it took up to 30 minutes for, for the first responders, for the firefighters to, to show up. Um, and earlier this year, when I pulled over to the side of the road at 1 in the morning to put out, uh, put out a fire at, at, a, at a house, um, or at least to help, again, another 30 minutes before people were, were, before the firefighters were able to get there. We have these issues, and I live in North Troy. You know, you, you saying that you don't have the services here in Craftsbury. I have the services in my town, and yet the response time was still 30 minutes. So having uh, uh, speediness and efficiencies in our departments are going to be very important. And when it comes to fire departments in particular, a big part of that, as she, as she said, is, is the volunteer rate right now. Um, a lot of people are not able to leave their jobs. They're not, allow, or they're not able to leave their jobs because they're worried about either getting fired or they're worried about not being able to be there to earn their paychecks. Um, and a time where we have the falling volunteer rates, which is also a cultural thing. It's, it's not just have to do with the money. It's also a cultural thing. But when people are struggling so hard, leaving their jobs when they need to get the paycheck is just not something that a lot of people can do. And you're at that point, the people that are showing up to fire calls, they're there for duty. They're there, they're there for a strong commitment to the community, and that's wonderful. But we also need to bridge the gap for the individuals that can't leave their jobs because of financial reasons. Um, so one thing that I've already done, and day one, this is something that I wanna, that I wanna hit the ground running on, and it's something that I've already been working on with members of the Senate from both parties and that is putting together bill packages to address the issues that we're seeing in our fire departments. I've gone around and visited um, many of our departments and I was very sad to hear that I was the only candidate 
that has come to see them, and I was the only candidate that they've ever uh, that they've ever had, really. And they don't even hear from the legislature legislators very often. They don't have them at their meetings. So by working with them, and I've continued to work with them, we're putting together a bill package right now to provide a little bit of extra funding where we can, and to really put in some institutional changes to make it easier for firefighters to go out to those fire calls and really beef up their departments. So thank you, Will, very much for that question. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Thank you, everybody. It's time for closing statements. We have a little extra time, so I'd like to give each candidate an extra minute, three minutes each. If they could include in their closing statement some advice they might give to some really awesome Northeast Kingdom students who live in Crassberry uh, in terms of their future and their education. So three minutes each. Mr. Douglas will go first, and Ms. Sims will finish. Thank you. Awesome. Again, thank you, everybody, for coming. Happy birthday, Owen. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I really appreciate everyone coming out to do this sort of thing for our students. As you're going to enter into civic life, into adulthood, these issues are very important, and these sort of things are important to attend. You need to be coming out and going to local debates. You need to be going out, meeting your legislators, writing questions to candidates, and not just sitting down and reading the, reading the news or watching the news and listening to what that tells you to think. You need to be free thinking, you need to be open-minded, and as I said in my opening statement, don't put yourself into any one box be thoughtful and open-minded. That is perhaps the biggest advice I can give to you. That and to be humble. Know your roots. Growing up, um, gr growing up when, I was, when I was much younger, um, I, was, I was a little braggadocious. And my father made it very, very clear to me that if you want to be a functioning adult in our communities, you can't brag about things. You can't be overly proud about things. Be proud of your accomplishments, but don't brag. Be, be humble. Being humble in all things, I think, is going to be, I think that is the root of great communities and a great society. So if I can leave you with anything, it's be humble. Don't put yourself in any box and keep an open mind. Look around, look at all the options you have in life and, and really take advantage of things like this when you have the opportunity to be involved in the civic process. Um, while you're thinking about these issues as students and as you're entering into adulthood, be concerned when it comes to the bottom line, when it comes to your wallets and your parents' wallets because the money makes the world go round in our communities and in our state and in our governments. And remember where the money is coming from. When the government spends money on something, you can't say, oh, the government will provide for this. The government will pay for this because it isn't the government paying for anything. It's the tax dollars that come out of your incomes, the tax dollars that come when you, when you buy something at the store. It comes from your property taxes. The government pays for nothing. You pay for everything. Those are some of the biggest things that we need to remember as Americans, and especially up here in Vermont where we face such important financial hardships. Remember where the money's coming from. Remember that it doesn't come out of nowhere and to take everything seriously because this is life. What we are doing and what we are all doing here, this isn't, this isn't, just, this isn't just a mock debate. This isn't just playtime. This is important because it has to do with people's lives in our communities, and it is just so vital that we actually have open conversations about things and open dialogues and not putting yourselves into boxes, especially as legislators. And you might not be sitting down in the state house, you might not be sitting on your local select board, but you still have a vote. That vote is your voice and let your voice and that vote be heard in the court of public opinion. Take to social media, make noise, call your legislators, demand answers, ideally be polite, but you know, demand answers, talk to candidates, and be engaged because these things matter and they are intimate to our way of life. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming, taking the time out of your work day. Um, and for the students, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Sims, closing statement. Thank you so much. First, I want to thank Sam for a civil and respectful conversation about the issues here. And I thank you all for taking your time out of your day to be here with us in person or to watch later online. I think we all know the challenges that we're facing. Stagnant wages, rising healthcare costs, scarce housing, and high property taxes. And I'm offering concrete, practical solutions to tackle these issues head on. With Senator Starr's retirement, the representation of our region is at a crossroads. And with the challenges that we face, we can't afford to send someone down to Montpelier who's gonna say no and sit on the sidelines. We need someone who's gonna roll up their sleeves, get the work done, and bring experienced leadership on behalf of our rural communities. 
in the house, I have a proven record of working across the aisle to get stuff done for the kingdom. And I'm ready to carry on Senator Starr's legacy as a fierce advocate for our region. I have a clear plan to make Vermont more affordable. Tax cuts for the middle class, lowering the cost of housing, health care, child care, and elder care. I'll work to make our communities safe, to protect public education while reining in costs, and safeguarding our individual freedoms and rural programs that are so essential for our way of life. Whether you're a conservative, a moderate, an independent, a Republican, or Democrat, I want to earn your vote. And I pledge that I will always listen to everyone in our region, regardless of party. Because I know that it's going to take all of us coming together to tackle these challenges and to create a future where everyone can live and work and raise a family and retire here with dignity. And I want to end by telling you something important. Don't wait. Don't wait to speak up, to share your ideas, to make a difference. Your voice matters right now not just in the future. Whether it's in school, in our community, in our home, you, you have the power to create positive change. Don't ever doubt that. The challenges that we face need your ideas, your energy, your creativity, your perspective. This place, your future, it all matters, and you are already making a difference. So please don't wait. Use your voice, believe in yourself, and know that you can and are making an impact today. Thank you. Thank you very much.